it's, it's a great pleasure to have invited Pauline uh, from Cambridge. Um, and uh, Professor Pauline Lowe received her PhD in statistics from UC Berkeley. After that, she was an assistant professor of statistics at the University of Pennsylvania. Um, later on, she was an assistant professor of electric and, uh, and computer engineering at U UW Medicine. Uh, later on, she got promoted to associate professor of statistics uh, and a visiting associate professor of statistics at Columbia University. She began a position as a lecturer in the De Department of Pure Mathematics and Mathematical Statistics at the University of Cambridge. Um, and Pauline's current research interest includes high dimensional statistics, robustness, and differential privacy. She's a recipient of NSF Korea Award, ARO Young, Investiga Young Investigator Award, IMS Tweedy and Bernoulli Society New Research Awards, and the Hertz Fellowship. Uh, the list goes on, uh, but I would like to save time uh, for the speech. Uh, so let's please welcome Professor Pauline Lowe. Okay, um, thanks a lot, Nian. So thank you for the invitation, and I'm glad to join you all virtually. So I'll be talking about um, two projects in this talk, and one is a little bit older, um, something that I did um, a couple of years ago, showing how the Huber loss can be useful for high dimensional linear regression. And then the second part of the talk, I will focus on some more recent work with um, Varun Zog and our joint student, Anke Pensia, um, where we study the use of Huber regression for um, adversarially um, contaminated data. So just to give you a very brief introduction to robust statistics, um, it's an area, a subfield of statistics that is quite old. It um, was first introduced in the 1960s and 70s and 80s. Um, and um, it, the main characters um, in the early days of robust statistics were Hoover, Tukey, and Hubble, and um, of course their, their students and grand students and so on. Um, and there were two main goals, and the first is to develop um, new estimators that perform well even under deviations from model assumptions. And these model assumptions might be um, that the data are drawn IID from a Gaussian or sub-Gaussian distribution or some other nice distribution, um, they might be assumptions that data are IID and et cetera, et cetera. Um, and secondly, the goal is to quantify the relative performance of different estimators um, with respect to various deviations. So um, in addition to declaring that an estimator is robust, you'd like to know, well, robust um, in what sense and is one robust estimator better than another one? So there are sort of two um, fundamental ideas, concepts from robust statistics, and um, these aren't directly related to what I'm going to talk about today, but to give you some sense of the lay of the land. So the first notion of robustness is sort of a local notion, and it tells you um, what is the, um, the rate of change of your estimator as you contaminate with a point mass in some direction. So the influence function is a function of x, which is the position at which you want to contaminate the distribution. And the influence function is a population level notion. So you can think about your clean data as being drawn from a distribution with CDFF. And now you look at the um, behavior of your, of your estimator when you apply it to an epsilon contaminated mixture, which, where one minus epsilon um, fraction of the time you draw from the distribution F and the other epsilon fraction of the time you draw from this contaminating point mass X. And you see what the rate of change of your estimator is. And um, a, an estimator is declared to be robust if the influence function is bounded in X um, as the, the position um, ranges over all possible values. There's also another notion of um, robustness, which is known as the breakdown point. And it's a much rougher notion. So it sort of says, um, what, what is the fraction of the data that I need to change in order to make the estimator blow up? So as an, as an example, um, kind of classically, you can think about the median versus the empirical mean. And um, folklore or general knowledge tells you that a median is more robust than the mean. But you might ask, in what sense is the median more robust than the mean? So one sense is in the breakdown point sense, um, that if you want to make the empirical mean go off to infinity, you can just change one point. So the breakdown point is 1 over n. For the median, if you want to make the median go off to infinity, um, as a function of your original data set x, then um, the, the number of points you need to change is closer to one half. And if you want to look at instead the influence function, you'll find that the empirical mean has an unbounded influence function because if you send x off to infinity, then the, um, the rate of change is going to be, go off to infinity as well. Whereas for a median, it turns out that this is bounded. 
So this shows that um, depending on what criteria you look at, the different estimators may or may not be concluded to be robust. It just depends on what sort of contaminations and what sort of way that you're using to measure um, the level of contamination. So throughout this talk, we are going to be focusing on, um, on linear regression. So we assume that our clean data are drawn IID from a linear model, and we, we draw these pairs XI, YI. Um, and we're going to assume throughout that the Xs are random as well as the epsilons. And furthermore, that the distribution of the epsilon has mean zero. So for um, some more general theory on the linear model, one might only want to assume that the um, expectation of the epsilons given the x's has mean zero, for instance, or that the x's might be fixed and only the epsilons are random. But for our theory, we, we require the x's to be um, random and IID as well. So in classical um, robust statistics, uh, the problem of linear regression was studied by Hoover and others. And um, the idea is that if you, if you use a, an objective function that's something other than least squares, this leads to better robustness properties. So um, you, you're probably most used to least squares linear regression where the loss function that you use um, is the squared loss. And um, but it turns out that just as the empirical mean does badly for contaminated data, similarly using a squared loss for linear regression does badly when you have contamination or even some heavy tailedness in your errors. Um, so this is the reason for using a more general loss function, um, which is known as an M estimator. This is um, notation that was coined by Hoover, where M stands for minimize. So you're minimizing some arbitrary loss function applied to your residuals. And um, to, to get some insight on why you might use another loss function, well, it turns out that um, if the epsilons um, come from a Gaussian distribution, then the maximum likelihood estimator corresponds to the least squared loss, the, the squared loss. But if your epsilons come from some other distribution, for instance, a distribution with very heavy tails, then you might actually want a loss function that looks quite different. Um, it could be something like a non-convex non loss, even if you have very heavy tails. Um, another motivating calculation from classical robust statistics um, tells you that it is actually beneficial to use a loss function with a bounded derivative. And the, the reasoning is as follows. So if you calculate the influence function, um, then as I said, it's the rate of change of your estimator as you contaminate um, at one position. Now, since we're talking about linear regression, we contaminate according to these xy pairs. Um, and if you do the calculation, you find that in fact, the, the form of the, um, of the influence function is that it's L prime applied to the residuals multiplied by x. So for the time being, imagine that the x's are bounded and nicely controlled and it's just the y's that are allowed to vary. Then you'll see that um, if L prime is bounded, then, um, then no matter what y is, the, the whole quantity, the influence function is also going to be bounded. Um, if you want to bound it also as a function of x, it turns out that you can add a weighting function to the M estimator. So actually um, here you would add another function that's some weight function of x um, that, weight, that down weights points with a high x. Um, but if you're satisfied with the, with the explanation that, um, that a bounded derivative L um, alleviates properties of deviating Ys, then you'll see that, um, so for the, for the least squared, for the squared loss, um, L prime is definitely not bounded. Um, but if you look at, at L prime, which, um, so for the squared loss, it's going to be linear. So now you chop it off to make it bounded. Well, that turns out to correspond to the derivative of the Hoover loss. So the Hoover loss is shown in red and that is quadratic and then becomes linear. And that's why the derivative is this nice um, piecewise linear bounded function. Um, then other loss functions such as the Tukey loss in blue um, are also quite popular from the robust statistics literature. And at least motivated from this perspective, you see that L prime is also bounded in that case. Now in this um, plot, we have um, the behavior of several different loss functions applied to some data where um, the, the bulk of it is roughly from um, roughly following a line and then we have a bunch of perhaps outliers. And we see that if you use the squared loss, you get a line that's kind of neither fitting the bulk of the data nor the outliers. Um, if you have a Hoover loss, it gets closer to the line that most of the data lie on. If you use a Tukey loss, it's, it's performing even better. So um, in, in the first part of this talk, um, my, my goal was to um, answer or address the question of what happens in high dimensions. Um, so we know in low dimensions that if we have a Hoover loss or a loss function with a bounded derivative, then some nice properties hold. Um, what happens in higher dimensions? And um, so here, just to have one, one slide of setup, well, we are assuming that we're drawing data from a linear model again. And now because we're in high dimensions, 
we need to assume that um, we have some sort of structural, st structural conditions on the true parameter vector beta star. So beta star is k-sparse, um, where k is going to be um, somewhat smaller than p. So the, the estimator to look at is very natural. Um, of course, if we're doing high dimensional regression, we can try to put an element penalty on things and see how the, how the, how the estimator behaves. Um, so of course, uh, that's just the beginning and um, there are various questions you might want to ask from a theoretical perspective. So if we use a loss function like a Tukey loss, which is not convex, but might seem to behave better empirically, um, what do we say about local versus global optima? Um, and secondly, even if we focus on just convex loss functions like the Hoover loss, then what can we say about the actual benefits of Hoover loss versus ordinary least squares? Um, and in particular, the, the statistical theory in high dimensional um, in high dimensional statistics usually focuses on these non asymptotic error bounds where um, n and p and k are, are appearing explicitly. So just arguing from the point of view of an influence function where everything is asymptotic um, doesn't quite um, make sense in, in, the, in the current way in which we view high dimensional regression. So I'm not going to address the first question. Um, I have done some work on non convex loss functions, but here we're just focusing on, on using the Hoover loss. Okay. So um, now here's a, a small calculation um, that kind of motivates um, where, some of the, where some of the ideas are coming from. So I'll remind you of how the analysis of the lasso usually goes. So um, here's the lasso where we have a, a squared error and we have an L1 penalty. And the usual analysis of the lasso begins with a basic inequality. So the basic inequality says that we know that the loss function applied to the global optimum beta hat is less than or equal to the loss function applied to beta star. And this gives us an inequality that we can play around with. So if you manipulate the inequality, you can arrive at an error bound um, where you put beta hat minus beta star two norm on the left-hand side. And, um, and it turns out that, well, with some simpl simplifications, if you choose the regularization parameter large enough, so larger than this random quantity, um, then you get a bound of, of this form. So of course, you want to get the best, the tightest possible um, guarantee for, um, for, for this calculation. So you would like to choose lambda to be as small as possible to make the bound as small as possible. So this is where the, um, the distributional assumptions usually come in. And um, if the x's and the epsilons are random and come from a Gaussian or more broadly sub-Gaussian distribution, then with high probability, this L infinity term is going to be bounded by square root log p over n using concentration inequalities. And that means that you can choose lambda to be on the order of square root log p over n. So you plug it in and you get um, a bound on the order of square root k log p over n. Okay, so now you can ask the question of um, what if I replace this squared error part with um, an m estimator? So one over n times the sum of the residuals. So you, would, you could start with the same basic inequality, but the terms would look a little bit different and try to rearrange it so that the L2 error is bounded by something. And it turns out that this works in more generality. So then the calculation is that um, if lambda is bigger than this other quantity, um, then you can show that, um, that you have an L2 error bound that's bounded by um, square root of k times, um, times whatever, well, times lambda. So you play the same game and you ask yourself, well, what is a good bound on this L infinity term, which I can then use as lambda? Um, and it turns out that in the more general case, so remember earlier we were looking at the least squared case. So L was the squared error loss. Um, L prime was uh, equal to the, uh, the identity. So we had X transpose epsilon over N. And we looked at this as a concentration inequality where we had a product of XI's and epsilon I's. But now we have L prime of epsilon um, where this is applied component wise. So this is an n dimensional vector where each component is L prime of epsilon one, L prime of epsilon two, and up to L prime of epsilon n. And the point is that even if the epsilon i's have some nasty distribution that's a heavy tail, um, if you use a bounded derivative loss function, then L prime of epsilon i is definitely a bounded random variable. Um, so it will certainly be sub Gaussian because um, sub Gaussianity refers to the tails of a random variable. And therefore, um, in fact, you can, um, you can conclude that um, lambda equal to square root log p over n will always work. Um, and therefore, the, the overall error bound that you get is constant times square root of k log p over n. Okay, so the point um, from this small calculation is that um, even if you have heavy tailed errors, um, then using a bounded derivative loss function like the Hoover loss will kind of counteract these um, bad tails and allow you to still get good rates. 
So there's one other um, technicality. And this other technicality is that if you run through the usual lasso population, um, it also requires verifying um, a restricted eigenvalue condition. And this has to do with the curvature of the loss function um, around um, beta star. And the, the curvature is kind of derived from a population level version because, um, well, the, the lasso um, objective function is a quadratic form. And at the population level version, you have some nice curvature in the covariance matrix. Um, it turns out that you can, and you need this in order to go from the basic inequality to this bound on beta hat minus beta star. So in the case when the loss function is um, more general, for instance, like a Huber loss, you can also get the same restricted eigenvalue type condition that you need, as long as the loss that you're looking at is sort of um, locally strongly convex around zero. And this is indeed the case for the Huber loss. But then this um, raises the natural question of, you know, what sort of parameter should you be using for your Huber loss? Um, so the Huber loss, um, it, it changes from quadratic to linear at some point. And, um, of course, if the, if the Huber loss parameter is too small, then you just get an absolute value function. So you don't have this nice curvature. Um, if the Huber loss parameter is too large, then you just get ordinary least squares. So obviously, you, shouldn't, you won't be able to get um, quite as good rates if you're just using least squares. Um, so hidden, into all of, hidden in this, this discussion is the fact that, in fact, the variance of the epsilon should be reflected in the, in the parameter of the Huber loss. Um, and what you want is you want that the, the, the parameter that you choose for the Huber loss is sort of calibrated to the scale of your, um, of your error. And another way to, to think about it is the following. So um, if you had these, um, the, these errors coming from some, some sort of scale family, um, where I guess uh, gamma is, or gamma or sigma or whatever you want to call it, um, this corresponds to the, the scale of your, of your error distribution. If you do maximum likelihood estimation, then the loss function should also sort of reflect the scale of your, um, of your errors. And the reason why this doesn't come up in, um, in ordinary least squares is that if you're looking at ordinary least squares, it turns out that the scale parameter just comes out as a, as a, scale, as a scale factor, which is a nuisance parameter. So when you're optimizing with respect to beta, you don't need to worry about sigma. But in more generality, um, there should be some calibration between um, the right, uh, the right shape of your loss function and the actual shape of your error distribution. Okay, so this is something that was known in, um, in classical robust statistics, even in the low dimensional setting, because here we're adding an L1 penalty to everything, but this problem of, of properly calibrating the loss function is still there in, in low dimensions. And the proposal was, or one of several proposals, but I think this one is quite natural, is that what you should really be doing is you should be rescaling your residuals by some estimate of the scale. So um, for instance, you can imagine doing Huber regression where you just choose your Huber loss to a parameter one. So you just fix it as something. And instead, um, you want to first estimate um, what your, or if you, if you magically knew what the true um, scale parameter was, you would just rescale by that. But if, you can, if someone can tell you an estimate of the scale that's pretty close to the true sigma star, then this should also work. But then you ask the question of, um, you know, how, how do you actually do this? How, how would you hope to get a good initial um, estimate of sigma, of sigma star when you don't know what um, beta is? Because ideally, you would like to look at, um, at, at some good estimate of beta. And from that, estimate your residuals, and then estimate the scale of your residuals, and then plug that in, and then maybe do a Huber regression on top of it. But that requires um, having a good estimate of beta to begin with. So one proposal that has um, been shown to work pretty well empirically is to estimate um, the, an initial beta using something like least trim squares. Um, least trim squares is where you sum up the squares of the residuals, but not all the n residuals, just the smallest n minus n alpha residuals. Um, and at least this seems to give some, reasonable, um, some reasonably good estimate of beta which will then allow you to maybe using something with a median absolute deviation, get an estimate of sigma, then you can plug it in and run your whole Huber, um, Huber method. But of course, this is not very rigorous. Um, one, one complication is that least trim squares itself is not a convex objective function. Um, and so, and then another problem is that least trim squares itself requires some sort of tuning because you would need to know how many points to ignore when you're, when you're doing least trim squares. Um, so in my work, um, the, the idea I came up with was to use this, um, this method called Levski's method. And Levski's method actually comes from a completely different direction um, in non-parametric regression as a way for choosing the optimal bandwidth parameter when you don't know um, certain properties of your data generating distribution. 
And um, I, I became aware of Lepsky's method um, through the high dimensional statistics, um, high dimensional regression literature, um, when it was proposed as a tuning parameter selection method for the lasso. So earlier I said that when you, um, when you do lasso regression, the optimal parameter for lambda, the optimal value for lambda is square root log p over n. And it turns out that that's not exactly true. That's hiding a scale parameter as well. So even if you just analyze the usual um, lasso regression, the optimal choice of lambda is sigma times square root log p over n, where sigma is the scale of your noise. And generally, you, you don't want to assume that you know what sigma is ahead of time. So there have been lots of different proposals for um, how to get around this. Um, and and I mean, I don't know that one is necessarily better than the other, but um, the one that's relevant to what I'm going to talk about is this method based on Lepsky's method for, for tuning this parameter lambda. Okay, so to make things a little bit more explicit, what we're going to look at now is this L1 penalized Huber regression problem, where the Huber loss is fixed to have parameter one, and we are explicitly rescaling by the, um, the parameter sigma, which we don't know, but we would really like to know. And um, I'm I'm making, I'm putting a sigma here alongside the L1 penalty so that the lambda no longer depends on sigma. So here lambda, the optimal choice is really square root log p over n with no hidden constants depending on sigma. And what we would like to do is to try to find a way to select a good choice of sigma so that the overall um, value of beta hat is well behaved. And what we know is that if we magically were given the true sigma star, then beta hat sigma star would perform very well. So Lepsky's method can be applied in settings where you have a certain bound um, uh, for an estimator that depends on, an, on a parameter. And the bound has the nature that, well, it, it holds whenever um, the parameter is chosen to be bigger than some unknown value, which you would really like to get, your, get a handle on. On the other hand, the bound that you get gets worse and worse as you um, get further and further away from the optimal value. And that's exactly the setting we have here which is that if we use the Huber um, regression estimator where we actually choose the right sigma and we use that for gamma or some constant time sigma, um, then we have a good bound. On the other hand, if we let the Huber parameter get further and further away from the actual noise variance, we get closer to these squares and therefore we get bounds that get worse and worse. So here's a pictorial um, uh, illustration of what Lepsky's method looks like. So we have here the true sigma star and we don't know what that is a priori. And then we, we somehow are given some rough bounds on sigma star. And so as, as a sense of um, what these rough bounds might be, well, if we wanted a very rough bound on the variance of epsilons that we could compute from the data, we could compute the variance of the y's, the responses. But in general, that will grossly overestimate the variance of the epsilons. Um, but that at least gives us some, some rough bound. And you can do something similar to get a rough bound of um, a lower bound of sigma star. Okay. Then you create a gridding of the points in between sigma min and sigma max. And that gridding is actually in this exponential way. So sigma min, twice sigma min, four times sigma min, eight times sigma min, and so on. So that means that there aren't very many grid points, which is why you can afford to do this on a very, a very, rough, initial, um, a very rough initial interval that contains sigma star. Okay, and then what you do is you compute um, beta hat on every grid point. So you compute beta hat for, um, let's say, the grid point sigma j. And then you ask yourself whether sigma j um, passes a certain test. And the test that you do is you do pairwise comparisons of beta hat at sigma j with beta hat at sigma l, where sigma l is, is every grid point that's um, to the right of sigma j. Okay, And the, the test that you check is whether or not the two um, estimators are close to each other. So what you would really like to do is you would like to check whether the estimators are close to beta star. But obviously, you don't know what beta star is, so you can't do that. So the best you can do is, is compare estimators with each other. Um, and the idea is that if your sigma j happened to be to the right of sigma star, then of course you know that beta hat sigma j is close to beta hat is close to, to beta star, um, and beta hat sigma l is also close to beta star, and therefore the two should be close to each other. Where closeness is measured in terms of twice of the bound that you get with sigma l. Okay, so if sigma j passes this test, meaning that it's close to every estimator um, computed with every grid point to the right, then you declare that it's in a good set. Um, and at the end of the day, you look at the argument over all the points in the good set. Okay, so with high probability, we are guaranteed that every grid point in the blue region passes the test, because we know that all those points are, are with high probability close to beta star um, as they should be. Now, there's some chance that you have um, a grid point to the left of sigma star, which also passed the test, because after all, for, to apply Lepsky's method, we actually don't have any guarantee. We don't need any guarantee on, on how beta hat sigma behaves if sigma is less than sigma star. 
But what we do know is that if sigma j happened to pass the test, then beta hat sigma j must have been close to some grid point estimator that was close to sigma star since we were gridding out the interval to begin with. And that means that beta hat sigma j must be close to beta hat sigma l, where that is in itself very close to sigma star because that's a grid point that's close to sigma star. Okay, so what we're guaranteed is that um, the, with high probability, the beta hat sigma hat that we, we get at the end of the day is going to be close to optimal. So that means that its distance to beta star is up to a constant factor of what we would get if we magically knew the true sigma star. Actually, what it doesn't tell us is that sigma hat is close to sigma star. Um, because we might have gotten a point that was, you know, that just happened to have the estimator being close. But if later you wanted to go back and estimate sigma hat better, well, I mean, get a better estimate of sigma star, then now you have a good estimate of beta hat, so you can estimate sigma star again. Um, so this overall method um, doesn't require knowledge of the scale of sigma star, but it does require um, some knowledge of something. So it's not completely, um, well, it's not completely foolproof. So. Um, in particular, what is still hidden in the constant? Well, the constant also requires some knowledge of the restricted eigenvalue um, condition, which at least is a property of the x's. So it's like saying that you know something about the distribution um, from which your x's are, are being generated. Um, also, these pairwise comparisons will depend on k, because we require um, pairwise comparisons that are up to two times the constant factor times square root of k log p over n. So it requires some knowledge of an upper bound, let's say, of your sparsity, which may or may not be known in practice. Um, but the nice thing is that um, the, the choice of, of lambda and the choice of the scale no longer, well, you can choose the scale in, in this data adaptive way, and then you don't have to tune lambda again, because we, we already sort of separately, um, we explicitly put the dependence of sigma in the objective function that we were trying to optimize. OK, so, um, so there's nothing very sophisticated about what I just talked about, but I think this I like this work because it sort of um, gave a sense of how some intuition from classical robust statistics is also useful in informing what good estimators might be in high dimensions. Um, of course, the theory has to be somewhat different because in high dimensions, you're analyzing things that are not asymptotic. And a relatively simple calculation, especially simplified by the fact that the Hoover loss is itself convex, um, can give you these sorts of nice error bounds of the order of square root k log over n. And then I think this use of Lefsky's method is new, although it is, I mean, it's, it's not that simple, it's not that difficult to prove, and it, it follows quite naturally from the work on tuning parameter selection too. Okay, so, um, so the more exciting work um, that we worked quite hard on in this past year um, has, as I said, to do with the fact that Hoover regression is useful for, um, for more than just um, IID data, and more than just heavy-tailed data, but in fact, adversarially contaminated data. And um, that in itself was, was somewhat surprising. So um, let me introduce you to this, um, this area of adversarial contamination if you're not familiar with it yet. So adversarial contamination means that you, um, instead of drawing data in an IID fashion from some um, distribution, be it a heavy tail distribution or an epsilon contaminated distribution where you draw one minus epsilon fraction of the time from a nice clean distribution, epsilon fraction of the time from a, from a contaminating distribution. Instead of doing that, you draw your n IID points from some clean distribution. And then an adversary can come and inspect all the points that were drawn and move epsilon n of the points to whatever they want. And this is with full knowledge of all the points that were, um, all n points that were initially drawn and full knowledge of what estimator you're going to use. And in general, this is somewhat stronger than um, an assumption that the adversary can just, um, can, can just choose the remaining epsilon n points. And it, it breaks the independence between all of your points when you look at the, at the final set of observations. So this area um, of adversarial contamination was um, first formalized, I think, in 2016 by two papers that showed up in the Fox conference. And, um, and these papers focused on the question of mean estimation um, for multivariate data. And the, the, the question was, if we, have, um, if we have data coming from a Gaussian distribution and IID points from a Gaussian distribution, and now we do adversarial contamination at level epsilon, um, then what is an algorithm? Well, first of all, what are the optimal rates at which we can estimate the, the true mean of the, of the clean data? And secondly, what is the optimal, um, what are some algorithms that you can use to achieve this optimal rate? And it turns out that the optimal rates are order of epsilon up to log factors. So um, the fact that you're doing adversarial contamination, of course, um, can allow you to bias the, the result even with, with the best possible estimator. So in our work, we are going to look at the setting of adversarial contamination, but in linear regression. And the idea is that first, um, n IID points are drawn from a linear model. 
And then the adversary can come and contaminate epsilon endpoints in either the um, x's or the y's or possibly both. Okay. So um, the, the analysis in the case of mean estimation for multivariate um, data is already quite complicated. And the original paper by Diakon and Phyllis et al. was something like 120 pages and had two different algorithms, which have since then been, um, been somewhat streamlined and simplified. But, it's a bit complicated even to describe the algorithm, let alone the analysis. So I'm just going to, um, to say a little bit about it um, to tell you the relevant parts to the method that we use. Okay, so um, at some level, the, the, filter, the, the algorithm in Diaconical as at all that I'm going to describe, um, what it does is it looks at your possibly contaminated data. So you have your, your nice data cloud and the adversary has moved epsilon endpoints, perhaps further away or closer to the mean. So what this algorithm does is it, um, it iteratively removes um, points in, the, in this um, observed data set. And, um, and it tries to flag all the points that were moved far away from the mean. Um, if, and then it takes the empirical mean of what remains. So if the adversary happened to move some points closer to the mean, then it's actually OK, because you're going to be computing the empirical mean of whatever remains. And, and the way that points are removed is by looking at the sample covariance matrix of your points. So if points tend to stick out, so if, if you, have, you look at the, at the largest eigenvalue and you kind of truncate the points that are, that are sticking out of your data cloud and you do this iteratively. Um, and this, the way I've described this algorithm, it's sort of designed for isotropic data. So when, you're, um, when your clean distribution, let's say, is, um, has covariance matrix equal to the identity, um, because then you know that if points are, um, are are sticking out in terms of the highest eigenvalue, then of course they, they're outliers. So you can this makes sense. Um, if your unknown, if your clean distribution has a known covariance matrix which is not the identity, you can still rescale your data and, and perform this this method. Um, if your un, if your clean distribution has an unknown covariance matrix, there have been adaptations of this method that. Um, work as well in that setting, but they're even more complicated because you need to estimate your covariance as well as the mean at the same time. Okay. Um, so I, again, I don't want to get too much into the, into the details of this, but there's one important um, idea that I want to highlight. So in the analysis of why this um, filtering algorithm works, namely you filter your data and then you perform a sample covariance, is the fact, is this notion of a stable subset. So the idea is that inside your contaminated data um, lies a stable subset, a large stable subset. And what is a stable subset? A stable subset has the property that the empirical mean of the points in the set are close to the true mean of the, of the uncontaminated distribution. The sample covariance of the points in the set are close to the, uh, of the, tr the true, uh, to the true um, covariance matrix, which we're assuming is a multiple of the identity. Um, and furthermore, this is true not only of the set, but of any slightly smaller set as well. Um, and in particular, the contaminated data, um, the, the adversarially contaminated data does in fact have a stable subset inside it, which is pretty much what you get when you remove all of these um, outliers that, that were moved far away. Um, so the filtering algorithm um, can be shown, and this, is, this comes out of the analysis of Diaconicolas et al. It can be shown to identify a large stable set with high probability um, when the data are, um, are contaminated from, uh, are, are coming from a clean distribution that has been epsilon contaminated. Um, and so, but, but then the, the property that is usually used um, in, in stability is the fact that the sample, the sample mean is well behaved, right? Because at the end of the day, what are you gonna do? You're gonna take the empirical mean of the data that, um, that fall out of your filtering algorithm, and you want that to be close to mu. But the property that we leverage in our work is the fact that not only is the mean close, but actually the sample covariance matrix is close. Okay, so, so the way that this work um, sort of arose was it was a confluence of different things. So my student Ankit was taking a class from Ilias at Wisconsin um, on, um, on adversarial contamination and mean estimation. And then he realized, well, if we have this nice property of the sample mean, then maybe we should leverage the nice property of the sample covariance to use this later in some other algorithms. And what are some of those algorithms? Well, linear regression turns out to be one algorithm when it can be quite useful that your um, covariates have some nice property. Okay, so let me now um, formalize this a tiny bit more. So, um, so we're back to our linear model. This is where the clean distribution is coming from. Um, and what do we assume? Well, we assume that the covariates um, are mean zero and identity covariance or known covariance. So we can deal with the known covariance as well. Um, we also assume that we have a bounded fourth moment on our covariates. So in particular, this is much more general than assuming that we have Gaussian data that are contaminated. 
Um, we, this allows for heavy tail data as well. We just need fourth bounded fourth moments. Um, now I've changed my notation. So the noise distribution, the noise random variable is Z instead of epsilon because we use epsilon as our um, fraction of adversarial contamination. Um, we assume that our noise is independent of the X's and has mean zero. And um, well, I'll, 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 I'll go through a couple different results um, that involve bounded first and second moments. So I'll introduce the moment assumptions later. But in particular, the clean distribution also only needs to have bounded um, low order moments rather than being Gaussian. Okay, um, we're going to work in a low dimensional setting um, rather than the high dimensional setting that I was talking about earlier. And um, just to, to drive this point home, so we draw these end data points from the um, linear model, possibly heavy tailed linear model, and then the adversary comes and contaminates epsilon endpoints in possibly the x's or the y's. So um, we're going to focus on, on this, um, on Hoover regression, at least for the time being. So um, what we do is, well, I guess I, I kind of already said this and I will say this again, but what we do is we look at, at our data points, we look at just the x's and we're gonna run those x's through the filter because we want to, to extract a subset so that the covariance matrices are well behaved. And for the points that, that survive the filter, um, we look at their corresponding y's and we run Hoover regression on, on those points. So for the y's, for the x's that didn't survive the filter, we throw those away and we, we just focus on the, on the ones that survive. Okay, and this was sort of a, a confluence of, um, of work in the sense that there were, there were two papers that were published in, in 2020 um, that focused on, on the, the good behavior of, of Hoover regression when you have um, possibly deviant y's. Um, so one paper that I'll point out is by Asan et al. Um, I think Munsin was in the seminar, so um, he was one of the authors of this paper. And um, this, this paper studied the, the good behavior of Hoover regression when the Ys are, um, are possibly heavy tailed. Um, and, and then there was also a paper that showed that um, when the Ys are in fact adversarially contaminated, um, then the Hoover, Hoover regression also performs well. Okay, so, so we were thinking, well, if Hoover regression can perform well when you have Ys that are behaving badly, um, then maybe, and it turns out that the answer is yes, but in, in the analysis of these papers, you can isolate the, where, where it requires distributional assumptions on the Xs and see that it only really depends on nice properties of sample covariances or sample covariance-like um, objects. So the idea was to apply the filtering algorithm, as I said, um, on the x's, clean up the x's, and then um, try to follow the analysis of Hoover regression for adversarially contaminated y's and see that, um, that the final result um, has, has good rates. So here's the, um, the theorem for Hoover regression. And the theorem, as, as promised, it only requires um, some, some small bounded moment assumptions on z's. So we just assume that we have bounded second moments. Um, and the, the theorem says that, well, you need to choose your parameters correctly, obviously. So um, we're going to run this filtering algorithm and the filtering algorithm has a parameter too, which tells you how many points you remove. So you want to remove roughly the order of the amount of contam contamination. Um, then there's the Hoover parameter and the Hoover parameter also needs to depend on the noise variance, not surprisingly. So if you choose the noise, the Hoover parameter to be constant order um, multiple of the, of the noise variance, um, then you get a bound of this form. Um, and the bound gets worse and worse if, if the Hoover parameter gets larger and larger, just like we saw in the first half of the talk. So this bound alone might not mean that much to you, but um, if you have immersed yourself in this literature, um, you'll see that this rate is in fact rate optimal. Um, and so it's rate optimal in the sense that it's, it's the best rate that you can get if you have um, data that are coming from um, this, this IID linear regression model with bounded fourth and second moments. Um, on the on the covariates and the noise, um, and there's then the epsilon contamination due to the adversary. And as is common in this literature, um, people also look at the case when the covariates have bounded um, higher order moments rather than just fourth moments. Um, and in that case, it turns out that the optimal rate, which has been proven in, in previous literature, it becomes epsilon to the one minus one over k. So in this case, we're assuming bounded fourth moments, and that's why we have epsilon to the three quarters. And if you have actually um, Gaussian data for the x's that are then contaminated, then they have bounded everything moments. So the, the actual, the optimal rate is going to be epsilon instead. Okay. Um, and then if you, if you care about tying this to the first part of the talk, well, if you don't know what the, um, what the Hoover parameter should be, you can also use the Lepsky type method to get away with the fact that, I mean, because the bound that you have has the same property that as long as gamma is large enough, you have a good bound. If gamma gets too large, then you have a bound that gets worse and worse. Okay. 
So I'm not going to go through the proof, um, but the at some level, um, the proof has, uh, it extracts these ideas that, I mean, it extracts the parts of the proofs for Hoover regression um, with, with uh, heavy-tailed or contaminated responses and, um, and shows you that that in fact the, the, the conditions that are that are necessary that are sufficient for the proof to go through just depend on good behavior of the filtered covariates where you look at these sort of covariance matrix, matrices and this can be guaranteed um, through um, through the through the guarantees of of the filtering algorithm itself run on adversarially contaminated data. Okay, so um, so the, the topic of adversarial contamination with mean estimation um, was then generalized to estimation of many different things. Um, and people have, in fact, studied, as I said, linear regression when just the response variables are contaminated. Um, but there's relatively little work that studies um, linear regression when both the covariates and responses can be contaminated. So here I have a list of um, a bunch of different papers that, that study the, the same setting that we did, where you have contamination in both the x's and the y's. Um, it might look like a lot of papers, but on the other hand, the fact that there's only a total of seven papers here shows you that there hasn't been that much work. So there are some um, nice um, there are some nice papers from 2019 and 2020 that study robust gradient descent. So um, the idea is that you you modify the gradient descent algorithm and you make all the gradient iterates themselves robust using the sort of filtering algorithm as a subroutine, um, which I personally like a lot. Um, but they don't quite achieve the optimal rates in the linear regression case since they were um, designed to be for general empirical risk minimization objective functions. Um, in 2019, there was some work by Diaconicolas et al. in the case of contamination for covariates and responses, but only when um, the covariates and responses came from a Gaussian distribution, which was then contaminated. In our setting, we're looking at a much more general setting for um, possibly heavy-tailed distributions. Then as we were finishing up this paper in the latter part of 2020, a bunch of other papers appeared on the archive. So we were about to claim that we were sort of the first to get a nice polynomial time algorithm that had near optimal rates. And then there are other algorithms. So this is no, I mean, it's not true that we were the first, we were perhaps almost the first, but I think it's fair to say that the, um, the algorithm that we came up with is sort of elegant um, because what you do is you still run Hoover regression. Um, in fact, some of these papers require something like a sum of squares type procedure, which is um, very hard to, to compute and implement. But um, I mean, our method just says run this filtering algorithm and then, um, and then run Hoover regression. Um, it's also worth noting, I think, from a philosophical perspective that, um, so we were looking at a combination of both heavy-tailed and adversarially contaminated data. Um, and there have been quite a few recent papers on um, adversarial contamination, which show that actually the same estimators that give you optimal rates for adversarially contaminated data also seem to be um, optimal for heavy-tailed data. IID heavy tail data. And it's, it's sort of because, well, if you have um, a method, whether it's a regression method or a mean estimation method that performs well for adversarially contaminated data, that means it can tolerate some small fraction of data which are, um, which are purposely moved to being far away. And for heavy tail data, due to random sampling, you also have some small fraction of data that are, that are moved far away. Um, so what we did in our work was we sort of looked at it all together. Um, and we showed that, in fact, if you have heavy tail data and then you, you put on adversarial contamination on top of that, you can, still, um, you can still handle everything with the same algorithm. OK, so after studying Hoover regression, um, we thought, well, what are some other regression methods out there that deal with only contamination in the Ys? And can we also run them through a filter and, and get some reasonable um, error guarantees? So we analyzed the least trim squares algorithm and we analyzed the least absolute deviation algorithm. So least trim squares, um, I've already shown you the objective before. It's the sum of the squared errors where you just um, trim up to some, um, up to N minus M. Um, and there was a paper from 2015 which studied least trim squares for adversarially contaminated Ys. Now, if you remember the, the adversarially contaminated um, papers came out in 2016. So this wasn't called adversarial contamination, but it is essentially studying this problem where the Ys are allowed to be perturbed. Some epsilon n fraction of them are allowed to be perturbed by our arbitrary value. Um, and if you look at the analysis in that paper, well, it was um, designed to hold in the case when the, the covariates are drawn from a Gaussian, IID Gaussian distribution. Um, and that's, of course, where we want to deviate because we want to allow the Xs to be contaminated as well. 
Um, but if you look at the analysis of that paper, it also has this um, condition that kind of um, smells like stability. So it has to do with these covariance matrices, and it has to do with the behavior of the covariance matrices, matrices over different subsets of the data. And one can show that this kind of condition also follows from stability. Um, so the other thing, though, about least term squares is that it's not convex. Um, and fortunately, um, actually, the, the, the paper of Batia et al. studies an alternating minimization algorithm and the output of that. So there's no gap between theory and practice of what you can achieve al algorithmically and, um, and what you can prove something about. So um, the analysis of Batia et al. shows that under these nice covariance assumptions, um, the output of an alternating minimization algorithm um, has good error guarantees. And what is alternating minimization? Well, I won't go through the details, but um, as you might imagine, alternating minimization sort of alternates between um, estimating beta and estimating the subset of the data that happened to, um, to be the, the one that was, um, well, so least trim squares, you're choosing a subset of the data to sum up the squares. So it's sort of choosing that set that you're using to trim off. Um, so, so the Bhatia et al. work um, showed that the, the output of this alternating minimization has good error amounts. Okay, so in our work, um, by kind of picking apart the proof and, um, and trying to, to prove that certain things um, uh, fell out of, of the guarantee of the filter, this is the theorem that we arrived at. So here we assume that we have um, second mo moment, finite second moment assumptions on the Z's, and I've written it in a way where we can allow for higher order moment assumptions as well. Um, and if we now choose our um, trimming parameter appropriately, where m is the number of points that we're going to ignore when we do least trim squares, and we again choose our, um, our filtering parameter appropriately, then we get a bound of this form. So compared to the earlier bound, this is considerably worse because the Hoover bound had a square root over everything. It was like roughly square root of p log p over n. Um, and in order to get a square root over everything, you need k prime to be infinity. So that means that you need to have, um, you have, you have to have all moments which are bounded, which is not optimal. Um, and, but as I'll, as I'll mention later, it turns out that through a, a simple post-processing step, you can, you can get better guarantees. So you can think about this as sort of a good initial estimator. Like it's not completely vacuous. It's just not quite optimal. Okay, so filtered least trim squares um, still gives you some sort of reasonable rate. Um, the, the proof idea, I won't go through the details again, but it, it comes through looking at the Vati et al. analysis and sort of analyzing um, how the dependence on x's can be generalized to not just IID Gaussians, but more general, um, well, more general filtered covariates. Okay, and then the last um, estimator is least absolute deviation. So least absolute deviation is the sum of the absolute values of the, of the errors. And this was um, analyzed for, um, for adversarially contaminated Wise in a paper by Kamakura and Price in 2019. Um, and the conditions that were needed in that setting will also look a little bit like stability. So instead of looking at covariance matrices, these are empirical averages of these projections um, onto, onto different vectors. Um, and it turns out that this also follows um, from the, the guarantees of the filtering algorithm as well. Um, now, the work of Kamakura and Price, um, of course, they, they, they didn't look at the contaminated X's setting. They were, again, designing things for IND Gaussians. Um, and they actually looked at a high dimensional setting, which is not our focus here. So we, we simplified their proof and, and mined the important parts to show that filtered least absolute deviation also has some error bounds. Okay, and this is the error bound that we achieved. Um, so we assumed here that we just have a bounded first moment. Um, and the error rates are not very good at all. They're kind of constant order, but it turns out that that's also good enough um, for our post-processing algorithm later. And the, the one benefit of the least absolute deviation estimator as, as opposed to Hoover or least trim squares is that actually there's no tuning parameter involved. Um, so if you, I mean, I said that you could, you could deal with Hoover regression by using Lepsky's method, but that makes it a little bit less elegant. That means you, you do this filtered Hoover method um, for everything in a, in a grid, and it's not quite as straightforward as least absolute deviation. You really just filter once, and then you run least absolute deviation. Um, furthermore, the, um, the analysis actually doesn't require um, independence of the z's from the x's and is somewhat more general. OK, so I'm not going to go through the proof, but it, it, it goes through the same kind of process of showing that this um, stability condition holds with high probability for filtered covariance. So, um, so what's the post-processing algorithm that I've mentioned? Um, well, the post-processing algorithm, uh, so first you assume that you have some good initial estimator, um, beta hat one, and it's within some constant order of, 
uh, error of beta star. Um, and the idea is that you look at a slightly perturbed data set. So you start with your beta hat one, and then you add, um, you add this value for all of your n data points. This gives you a set of n p-dimensional points. And now you apply the filtering algorithm again. So this time as a mean estimation routine. So remember, filtering was a way of removing a bunch of points so that you could take the empirical mean of what remained. Okay, so what you do is you, you run this, you filter out these and data points and you take the empirical mean of what remains, and that's what you use as your final estimator. And your final estimator has these sorts of rates. Another way of thinking about this estimator is that it's kind of this one-step estimator. So you, um, as is common from robust statistics um, literature, you take your estimator and then you take one gradient step of your, um, of your least squares loss. And this is the data set that you have, and now you apply this robust mean estimation on top of it. So the result, the, the resulting error rates are near optimal. Um, you get a near optimal dependence on, instead of p log p over n, you have um, p log p n over n. Actually, the optimal error rates would be root p over n anyway, so we're, we're ignoring the log factor. Um, you don't quite get epsilon to the 3 quarters, you get epsilon to the 1 half instead. But that's still, um, I think it's fair to say it's near optimal in, in all the other parameters. Um, OK, so then I have a couple of simulations. Um, and Really, this is just to show that filtering is actually necessary. So you might wonder if Hoover regression is already um, doing so well when you just have adversarially contaminated Ys, then maybe when you have adversarially contaminated Xs, you don't even need to filter your data points. But actually, you do. So we ran some experiments with heavy-tailed um, Xs and Ys, and you can see that the filtered algorithm does better than the non-filtered algorithm. So that's the gap between the dotted lines and the, and the solid lines. Um, so that holds for Hoover, filtered Hoover, um, on heavy-tailed data, um, filtered least trim squares on heavy-tailed data, we still see a gap. And then um, filtered um, Hoover and least trim squares when you have adversarially contaminated data. Now, of course, we couldn't, um, we couldn't actually do adversarial contamination because that's hard to do. So we just planted some points, some fraction of the points with very large values um, in order to sort of simulate what an adversary might do. OK. So, um, so the main contribution in this part was to show that these classical robust regression estimators like Hoover regression, least trim squares, and least absolute deviation um, still perform well when you have adversarially contaminated data. And what you need to do first is apply this um, covariate filtering step that was um, designed for adversarially contaminated mean estimation. Um, and in fact, the, the least trim squares and least absolute deviation estimators, although they're not quite optimal um, from a first cut, after this additional post-processing step where you sort of do a one-step estimator, you can, you can achieve near optimal error rates. Um, so there are a couple of questions that we have thought a little bit about, um, but we're not quite sure how to attack in, in general. Um, the first one is that we would like to be able to extend this work to high dimensions. Um, it's not exactly clear whether this would work. So what we would want to do, for instance, is show that filtered L1 penalized Hoover regression is adversarially robust to X's, to corruptions in X's and Y's. Um, the, the difficulty is that the analysis of the filtering algorithm um, currently is, is designed for low dimensions. And secondly, for high dimensional regression, rather than just this nice behavior of um, minimum and mi maximum eigenvalues of subsets of the covariates, what you would want to do is um, get some kind of restricted eigenvalue type condition, which is a little bit different. Um, secondly, in the case of the unknown covariance, if you run the filtering method with an unknown covariance, um, then you get a guarantee which is not quite optimal for, um, for, uh, for linear regression. So we're not quite sure how to handle that case either. And then some of the papers that came up in the latter part of 2020, which are sort of um, competing methods for this work, are able to do away with this independence assumption between the x's and the noise. So it would be nice to be able to extend our analysis in that setting as well. Um, but we're currently not sure how to do that. We, we, need, we need independence critically in our analysis. Um, so that's it. Um, here are the references to the work. If you want more details, then I'm happy to take questions. <laughs>